as you can see, they had a very enjoyable time, to say the least. But uh, it'd be a shame if they all told you their testimony and I didn't tell you mine before we really got laid into all this. And so, go ahead and first, I, uh, I spent quite a few uh, months in Shreveport taking speech classes, so I'm compulsively obligated to, tell to introduce myself no matter how, ma how many of you may know me. <laughs> and so for those of you who are in here and don't know who I am, my name is Oren Langley. Uh, for the ones who do know me by that name, you've known me by that name for a very long time. My grandmother re refers to me as, hey, quit it, you rascal. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's her own thing. But... But I can tell you that it's, it's truly been an honor to work with these young people and our youth. Just throughout the year and then just coming in, just bringing them to camp, just, just walking alongside them, watching them grow in an environment where they, have, where they can't look to the outside world. It's secluded and it's completely surrounded by God. And to watch these young people grow in a place where it's, it's a hyper fixation and a hyper focus on God is such a phenomenal thing. And... I'm not going to dig too much into that because they're, you're going to be able to hear more of that tonight. And I know you've heard some of it this morning as well. And I encourage you all to come tonight, please. Come listen to these young people. I promise you they're going to be nervous, so you don't worry about that. But it's, they've got some phenomenal things to say, I can tell you that, just from hearing them talk about what the Lord had been doing in their life throughout the week. And it's just my blessing and my testimony is that. It's just being able to have that opportunity to watch those young people grow in such a manner. To be able to say, look, God has pointed something out in my life that I need to make an active change on. And that's, that's humility in its strongest form. To actively point out a place where you know you're wrong and then say that I, this is not good enough and to make that change actively, or at least start working towards steps to make that active change. Now, speaking of change, that will be the topic of what we're discussing today. Uh, we're going to be in Acts, and we're going to look through probably one of the greatest changes. There's been many changes to many men in Scripture, but this one, this, but this one change is basically how most of the New Testament got written. And so we're going to be looking at Saul. And this is going to span several chapters, so get ready to start flipping some pages. We're going to be doing a lot of reading. And so when it comes to change, change can either be something that happens very instantaneous, or it can be something that takes a while to happen. And so when you look in Genesis, and Pastor Baldwin looked at, pointed at something out in Genesis where it's the culmination of a bunch of years that led to an immediate moment of change. And he pointed at the life of Jacob and pointed how there was many years of Jacob's own living that come, came to a point where God put him in a spot where he had to come to terms with who he was. And in that moment, God changed him. And we're going to look at this place in Scripture and a long-term change isn't something that's necessarily only secluded to Paul. Or in this moment, we're going to see how he saw. We see this amongst several people in Scripture. We see it with Moses. We see it with David. We see it with Samuel, where they were called at one point, but it took a while for them to get to the point of change that they were called to. And so... First off, to just give some kind of a summarization before we start this reading of who Saul was. Saul was a Jewish man living in Israel. And he was present at the stoning and the, the martyrdom of Stephen. And he was a man who was very well consenting to it. It said, if you look in just the chapter beforehand, the chapter before where we start, it shows how he was standing there and allowed the, basically watched over the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And then afterward, how he actively took part in the persecution of who would have been called the way at this point. And actively took part in persecuting these Christians, pulling them out of their homes, men, women, and children, and dragging them off to jail to be tried. 
And so we're going to st actually start in chapter 9, where after all of these things have taken place, and he's going to actively be going on the road to Damascus. So starting in verse 1, we're going to read, and it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Excuse me. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled, and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what you must do. And the men that journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. And they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was there without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So one of the first aspects of change is, as what we see by here is you have to have that meeting with Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, there can be no change. And so first we're seeing this qualifying factor here with Saul. This qualifying factor for change is the fact that he had to come to a place where he had to accept Jesus was greater than he and stop actively going against him. Over the next few verses... I'm going to say first, over the next eight, eight or nine verses, we're going to see that Saul is waiting for, Je waiting for whoever it is that Jesus is going to send. And as we read, we're going to find out this man that Jesus sends is a man named Ananias. Jesus tells Ananias to go to, yeah, Jesus tells Ananias to go to a street called Straight and look for a certain house and look for this man named Saul. Now, Saul had developed a reputation this reputation of going out and actively persecuting these Christians. And Ananias, knowing this, says, Lord, don't you know that this is the man that's been trying to, that's been throwing people in prison, people who are surrendered to your name? And he says, go, because I have a purpose for him. With this change, Jesus had already developed a purpose for Saul. And it was, and so Ananias goes, he talks to Saul, he prays over him, and in this, the Holy Spirit is able to infill Paul, and the scales come off, or the blindness comes off like scales. And he is able to see, and he is then baptized. And so, what we're going to see next, and it says in verse 19, it says, And when he had received me, he was strengthened. Then Saul, certain days with the disciples, then Saul, certain days was with the disciples which were at Damascus. After that, he went and he stayed with these people, with the disciples of the way. And we're going to pick back up in verse 20, and it says, And straight away he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed, and said, Is it not he that destroyed them which are called on, the, on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. I'll tell you something. The second step of change is taking some kind of immediate action in it. You've got to go and show the people around you that there was a change. You have to make an external showing of an internal change. And this, the reason for this is because the people closest to you know who you were. And I can sit here and I can tell someone, Oh, oh, yeah, I may have done something, but if you don't purposely make a showing of it, they can't know that it happened. I'll give you a rather simple example. One way you know someone's taking a, is taking a shower is because they changed their clothes. I mean, I can sit here and I can tell someone, hey, look, I've been taking a shower all week, but if I'm still wearing the same stinky clothes from, all, from the days before, you're not going to see that. You're not going to believe that I did make that change, right? That I didn't make that cleaning and so with this, you see that there has to be an action period 
following after to, to further show that what I'm saying is true. And Saul did this to such an extent that the people there wanted to kill him. And so from this, he had to flee to Jerusalem, where he met up with more disciples. But these disciples were afraid of him. But because of what he had done in Damascus, there was someone there by the name of Barnabas who was able to say, look, this man did these things in Damascus. He preached. Yes, that may have been who he was, but this is who he is now. And he was able to stay with the disciples there in Jerusalem. I can only imagine that while he was staying with the disciples in both Damascus and in Jerusalem, he was still learning all the more that he could possibly try to learn. Try to learn as much as he could about Jesus Christ, about the gospel. And here we see that he stays some time with them, and we can only imagine that he's learning. And he's still there declaring Jesus Christ in the synagogues there in Jerusalem to the same extent that they still want to kill him. And so in this, Saul is sent to Tarsus so that he might not be killed. And so now we come to a point where we have a time period. Some historians looking across Scripture um, have believed that Saul spends about 10 years in Tarsus. And it's imagined that he's still learning about Jesus Christ, learning, teaching, preaching, taking up the family trade of tent making. And he's spending this time in Tarsus, all the while not yet having stepped into his calling not yet seeing the full fruition of his change. Because as we, if we look in Acts chapter 22, verse 15, Ananias very specifically told him, For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. That comes from Saul's retelling of everything that had happened in these chapters that we're reading. Saul is going through and retelling all the things, and he retells what Ananias told him, that Jesus Christ had told him, that he was to be a witness to all men. But you can just imagine just, just, you know, just that solitude of sitting there saying, like, all right, Lord, you told me I'm going to be a, a preacher, a witness to all men, but I'm stuck in Tarsus. But as we can look through Scripture, and we can see through Scripture, he never, just knowing the character of Saul at this point, we would know that he would never just sit idly by. And so it further, you know, proves the point of how he very well most likely would have been preaching in the synagogues there, take actively learning, actively trying to grow. He, so what we see here is that waiting requires, a change requires a waiting period. Although you may be called to something in your change, you may not get the chance to see it, not for a while. And we see this here as Saul waits, as Saul just waits on the calling of the Lord, waits, waits for it to take up point. And as he's been waiting here, and several other things happen, there starts to become a gathering of Christians in a city called Antioch. Or really, they're still called the way at this point. There's a gathering of them. These people that have been persecuted, that have been scattered, and now they're coming back together. And they're gathering in Antioch. And we're going to pick this back up in chapter 11. We're going to read more about that. Picking up in verse 19, it says, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to unto the Jews only. And some of them would, were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch spoke unto the Grecians, the Grecians are Greek-speaking Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the people was with them, and, the, the number, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all, 
and with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year that they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one from them named Agabus, as signified by the Spirit that there would be a great dearth or famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. When the, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which, was, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So, after we have this waiting period in Tarsus, we see the beginning of this call starting to take shape. We're seeing that Barnabas comes out seeking Saul, brings him to, ta- brings him to Antioch, to help teach and to help build this church that has been forming. And in this, he, is, he has the avenue to teach many different people that are in the city of Antioch. And after spending time there, he is sent to Jerusalem, which sets up the next part of his blessing. So what we see here is, because of the first step, which we talked about, which was change requires meeting Jesus Christ, because of that, he was able to come down this way. Now, it took years to get to this point. It took years. But never once do we ever see in Scripture that Saul strayed away. He pulled away just because he couldn't see it. And when we're sitting here, we're reading through it, he takes this time to build up everything that he's been building upon in Tarsus to teach it here. With this, out, with this avenue, I guess you could call it, to take, to take the word through, take the gospel through. And as we're going down, we're coming back through, and we're going to get to the very end of chapter 12, and we're going to finish it off here. In verse number 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon and that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them they sent them away. And in this, we see them finally taking the first steps into their ministry. This has been years in the making. But there's been one thing that has stayed the same through all of this. We see him still called Saul. There are many people who believe that on the day that Saul was saved, or when he was converted, that he became Paul. No, through all of this change, through all of this growth, through all of this, he was still Saul. God used the name of a man who had persecuted and killed Christians to become a great ministry, a great minister, a great missionary, still under that same name. We can see years of change culminating to the change in his ministry. And, it, and if you read shortly out there on past this, we see that he takes on the name of Paul. In this culture, it was common for people to have what was called a dual name, their Hebrew name and their Roman name. And it is believed by some historians that Saul took on the name of Paul in a manner to, since his ministry was to the Greeks and unto the Gentiles, that it would be something more acceptable. Because it was a Roman name, and it would be something like, okay, yeah, I have something in common with you now. Since as, we, as you look through Jewish customs, Jewish wouldn't even allow Gentiles to come into their home. 
And so there was already a great separation between Jews and Gentiles. And so we're seeing here Saul takes on this name of Paul to further that. Some believe that he even took it on because the name Paul means little, as if to further separate himself from being as great as Christ and that he was little compared to him. Why the exact change is pretty much, when you look through it, it's a lot of theory. But we see that it took years for him to come to that point. The Lord had to prepare him in both preparing the hearts of the people and preparing the field for work. Because if Saul had started being a missionary years before, he would never have had the background to be able to be able to reach these people more clearly, both Jews and Gentiles. Because they would have only seen him as Saul the persecutor. As you saw with his journey to Jerusalem. As you see, when you when you have farmers and they're farming the field, they can't develop, they can't harvest the field as soon as the seeds are planted. It's got to take time before the field is ready. And so While Saul was waiting in this time of change, the Lord was preparing his field. And so in this, we have people that become discouraged by the wait. They want to have that immediate, you know, that immediate just, I'm going to go out and have a day of Pentecost moment. As soon as I get the Holy Spirit. And that's just it's not quite right for you. The Lord's got to first prepare you while He's also preparing the field. But in this, it requires a long state of change. Change happens over a period of time, even, and it can also happen Im- immediately. The first immediate change, of course, is the coming to Christ and the acceptance of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, the wor- Lord works on you for the rest of your life. And you see what happens is when people come, become discouraged by this, when they know what their calling is, but they're not yet called to start on it, they sit in this moment of, oh, someone else is working on that, so I won't go and do it. When you see Saul, although he never was in the calling in that moment, was still working towards it. He was still going to people, still preaching the word, and still helping people and ministering as it was needed. And I say all this in encouragement for those who, have hold, who hold this discouragement in their heart. Because the Lord's still preparing you. Now, our ministry may never reach the mileage of what Saul, later on Paul, had. We may never travel the world. There are some people whose ministry started out at one of these churches that Saul planted, and they stayed there. I mean, we see this all over the United States where the Lord will call someone to a ministry, and usually it's right there in their own hometown. And they'll start on it, they'll take it, and they'll run with it, and the Lord will make great changes there and build them up while they're at it. But we've got to make that active call to say, God, I will not allow this period of wait to make me docile, to make me complacent. And I've told you several times, I've told them over and over again, they're probably tired of me saying it, a complacent Christian is a very dangerous Christian. Because a complacent Christian ends up making compromises. And these compromises will end up damaging or just hurting people. And so when you're seeing this, Paul is octave, octavely, actively taking the time to grow, to not be complacent, to not stand still. We see this in his bringing of re, uh, relief to Jerusalem during a famine. We see him in building the church in Antioch. We see him as he's preaching in Damascus and in Jerusalem to the point of where they want to kill him. And as you take it from here, as he goes into his missionary journeys, there are times between each of his journeys where he's sitting waiting, building tents. And it said that he was such a man of God that people would go take his handkerchief or take his tools and go lay them on people so that they would be healed. Saul never allowed his past to define his future because he knew he was changed. And he actively walked in that change every day. 
So I invite those who have at least had the change of salvation and have not, not necessarily done anything with it beyond that to make the choice today to, to continue walking in that change, to continue walking with the Lord so that He can continue to develop you, that you'd become active in that so that by the time you get to your point of calling, you will be ready. Because the Lord's going to move no matter what. And it's up to us to be a part of it. And for those of you who have yet to call Jesus, and but you want this change, I invite you as well. Because this is one of the single greatest decisions you can make in your entire life.